Hello everyone, this is going to be the uh, one hour loom video that looks at unit four which is bioenergetics. Okay, everything on the screen you see there is everything I'm going to talk about today um, dotted in with a little bit of required practicals. Okay, um, if you were able to make the live teams um, lesson earlier on today, we spoke about unit one, unit two and unit three which is cell, um, sort of cell structure and transport in unit one. Unit 2 was all about the digestive system and the circulatory system and Unit 3 was about infection, pathogens, disease and vaccinations and like drug um, drug development which is where we left off and kind of a, a bit of a rush to, um, to get that finished in time. So please have a look at the PowerPoint that I've uploaded to the uh, Teams file section for for the uh, live lesson. Um, included in there is also some um, checklists for what you need to know and also some practice exam questions which I will upload or, or by, by the time you're watching this I probably will have uploaded some um, mark schemes for it as well. So it includes loads and loads of pa uh, question papers. Um, don't worry about printing it off if you just use it on your screen with a, I don't know, with a piece of paper or something as you go through. That would be perfect. There's a mixture of questions on there of different levels. Um, I've tried to, to aim this at sort of a grade five-ish kind of thing and then anything that's required for triple or higher, what I'll have done is a bit like the live lesson, I'll just verbalize um, the triple or the higher stuff. Okay, obviously I won't cover everything. We don't have that long, um, but hopefully this provides sort of that last little bit to get you ready for paper one for your biology mock in December. So we've got about six weeks. Okay. Um, in this video I'm going to be talking about photosynthesis, the equation, um, what limits it, um, etc. And then we're going to move on to both types of respiration, the equations for those as well, and then exercise and your metabolism at the very end. Okay. Um, I'll try and pause this video and, and switch to me doing a required practical as we go through. Um, I've, I've raided the science prep room to take a, have a bit of equipment, don't tell anyone, um, to show you the two required practicals here, limiting photosynthesis and testing for starch. Okay, So I, I'm thinking it's going to be about 30 minutes for me to talk about the content and then about 30-ish minutes for me to talk about those practicals and to show you um, sort of the important parts of those practicals because they do feature heavily on the um, biology paper one stuff okay I haven't seen the paper that you'll be getting in December but I'm just picking out stuff that that sort of um, generally generally crops up okay if you have any questions about this unit 4 stuff please just get in touch uh, send an email ask somebody um, find me when we're back in school I really don't mind but this PowerPoint will also be available afterwards so if you wanted to use this for any notes obviously you can pause this and come back to it or rewind at any time you like so I hope that you don't need the PowerPoint afterwards um, but it will be there for you. Okay, Let me show you these checklists that I have um, produced. I say produced, that's really bad isn't it? Checklists that I found by a lovely company called Pixel. Um, these checklists that Pixel have produced, not me, I'm not taking credit for them, um, they include everything that you need to know for each unit. So uploaded onto the teams, you have a, a unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four uploaded. Um, if you want to print it out, print it out. If you want your teacher to print it out, just ask them. I'm sure they will um, will not mind doing that. And it includes everything that you need to know um, for each topic. And you either red it, amber it, or green it. Okay, red, I really don't know what this is. I need to go over it maybe three or four times before the test. Amber, sort of know it, I might go through it you know, twice maybe before the test. Green, I do know that, that's going to go to the bottom of my revision pile and uh, you know, I might look at it once, maybe twice. Be sure in your um, checklist to ignore stuff, if you're foundation, ignore anything that says higher tier only and if you're combined, ignore anything that says um, triple biology only. Okay, so there's this this checklist includes everything for everyone. So just ignore what doesn't apply to you. Um, very quickly before we start, just think about your revision. Okay, and your revision between now and the end of the year. 
what we generally find is students that start now and put in put in their effort now and just maintain that effort all the way through the year end up doing really well and you know it, it ends up being a lot easier than uh, people that start at Easter, for example, there are there are always, always someone that starts at Easter or later because they think that's enough time to revise. There is a lot, and you have what nine, ten, eleven GCSEs. I really don't know. Each of those GCSEs have multiple papers. Um, I know for science you've got six papers, so it ends up being a lot of work. So space it out now. I'm sure you'll have been having those conversations with your Year Eleven form tutors, as I did last year with mine, um, about how how you're going to do it. Okay. Come and see me, come and see your science teacher, we'll, we'll help you. If you approach this as little and often, that's better than cramming all in one go. Okay, You memorise it a lot more when you do little and often and you revisit stuff a couple of times before an exam. So bear that in mind. Um, let's start straight away with um, some photosynthesis. So that's my key points out of the way. Okay? Um, photosynthesis then means photo, which is light, and then synthesis means to create something. So overall, we'd say photosynthesis is using light to make new products, and that's both glucose and oxygen. Okay, so for our word equation, which foundation needs to know, you have water plus carbon dioxide, and light is used to convert that into glucose and oxygen. Now, glucose is our useful waste product. Obviously, because it's waste, it's used, it's sent away. Um, oxygen is a non-useful waste product, so it's just it's just left to go. Um, if you're doing higher, and you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing for foundation to know this as well. The symbols of all of these things, some of them you'll know, some of them will be a bit trickier to remember. Water symbol is H2O, carbon dioxide CO2. Leave light as light, and then glucose is C6H12O6, and oxygen's O2. So that is the unbalanced symbol equation and the word equation for photosynthesis. If you want to go one step further and balance it for higher or for triple, this isn't um, foundation. Foundation, you do not need to balance it. So don't worry if you're foundation. But for higher and triple, you put a 6 in front of H2O, in front of CO2, and in front of O2 as well. So it's, it's, it's what I call the devil's equation because it ends up being 666. Six, six. Yeah, so 6 in front of H2O, 6 in front of CO2, 6 in front of O2. And that's the equation for photosynthesis. We have our reactants, water and carbon dioxide. We have our products, glucose and oxygen. So why is this important? So if we put our word equation there with light in as well, we can say that the higher the rate of photosynthesis, the more products are made. Makes sense? If we have more photosynthesis, more carbon dioxide, water and light, then we get more glucose and we get more oxygen. Oxygen is released as a gas and that's, that leaves through the stomata. If it does leave, it's left through the stomata, which is on the underside of the leaf. Glucose has a number of different uses. Okay, we need to know, it's about five, five different uses, so we need to know a couple of examples. Okay? Um, going on for higher and going on for triple, you'll need to know them all. Yeah? If uh, for foundation, just think about remembering a couple of them. They'll be really useful. Okay? So, to start with, we have got Glucose being used in respiration, and respiration will come up a little bit later in my video. But glucose is used in respiration. The second one is glucose can be stored as starch, and starch is a storage molecule. It's very long chain, lots and lots of glucose molecules in a line. These are stored away, ready to be used later when a plant needs them. Okay, so think of a potato. A potato plant has a lot of starch. It's very starchy plant because it's storing all of that glucose and sending it down to the roots into the tubers to store as starch and then we eat it. Um, the third one is a number, a number of things in one and that's glucose being used to make new chemicals. So they use proteins for growth, fat for storage, so think of um, peanuts and nuts, they have lots of fats and oils in, and then cellulose to strengthen the cell wall. And remember, if you were part of the live teams lesson from earlier, the cell wall is there for support. It's not there for protection. So people always love to say cell wall is there to protect the cell. If you want to go and stamp on a plant, um, the cell wall is not going to protect that plant. Okay? I'm not advocating damaging plants at all. Please don't go and stamp on plants. They're very good for us and they give us loads of glucose and oxygen. So we should be their friends. But... It's only there for support, not 
for protection. I can't make that any clearer. People always lose marks on that. The reason that it's good for support is because it has a lot of cellulose in, and that's again, it's just glucose um, formed a, a bigger molecule that's really strong. Okay? So, we can limit, phot or photosynthesis can be limited, should we say, by three things. Okay, so first thing, it can be limited by light, and that's to say, the darker it is, the less photosynthesis happens. The higher the light intensity, the, the sunnier it is, the more photosynthesis you get, because light energy is, is that driving force to photosynthesis. The second one is carbon dioxide concentration, so we can see carbon dioxide as, the, as a reactant, water plus carbon dioxide. So the more of that we have, the more we'll react and form glucose and oxygen. Okay, so the more carbon dioxide, the higher the rate of photosynthesis, again. And the third one is a little bit of a different graph. Let's move that out of the way. Um, and our graph this time is saying that um, if the temperature is too cold or too hot, then we have the enzymes that work. And again, enzymes came up in the um, unit two of my lives team lesson earlier. And that will limit the rate of photosynthesis as well. So let's go through those in a tiny bit more detail. To start with light intensity, so as the graph starts to, as the gradient starts to increase, okay, so we've got a really steep gradient to start with, at that point, light intensity is what limits photosynthesis. Okay, so it's actual light intensity that is preventing photosynthesis from happening as fast as it possibly could. Afterwards, we can see light intensity is increased all the way along there, light intensity increases, but we still don't have photosynthesis increasing its rate. That's because something else is, in, is limiting it. Okay, that's all we have to say, something else. Okay? This graph, if you look very closely, is very similar to the graph for um, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide concentration is pretty much identical. So we're just swapping around the words light intensity with carbon dioxide. It's the same shape graph. So carbon dioxide concentration limits photosynthesis on the left-hand side there, as the gradient's quite steep. When the gradient plateaus and levels out, something else limits photosynthesis. Something else. That can either be, well, we've got three things that limit photosynthesis, so it could be one of three. The last graph looks a bit different. Okay, it's not the same shape, but we can we can split it down into into three parts really. Um, it's temperature this time that's affecting the rate of photosynthesis. So when we've got a really low temperature, that means we've got a really low energy. Okay, so uh, for a chemical reaction to happen, we need energy, and if the temperature is low, enzymes don't have enough energy to work. It's too cold. On the opposite end of the scale. If it's really, really hot, then the enzymes have way too much energy, they get way too hot, and they start to lose their shape. They start to denature. And I'm going to say this a lot during this unit uh, and video. During the live teams lesson that we had earlier, we spoke about enzymes, and we spoke about how enzymes can change shape because of temperature and pH. So this is just an application of that knowledge on enzymes. So for the higher level marks, these two topics, topic two and topic uh, unit two and unit four, which what these are, really do interlink quite a bit. At the top of that graph, though, we have what's known as an optimum temperature. That is the perfect temperature for the highest rate of reaction. For humans, that's generally 37 and a half degrees, give or take a few decimal places. Okay, so everything has an optimum temperature. Something that lives in a cold environment might have a lower temperature that's optimum. Something in a higher, uh, a hotter environment might have a higher optimum temperature. Depends what it is. Okay, that's why I've not put numbers on this graph. I'd like to have a look at these questions, pause the video, and then when you click resume, I'll go through the answers. Is that enough time? Have you paused it? Have you answered them? If you haven't answered them, then pause it again. I'll assume that you've done that. Um, okay, so the equation there describes photosynthesis. This comes up an awful lot. So from higher all the way up to triple, they will give you one or two things maybe. Um, with triple, they might say, just, just tell me the whole equation. We're not going to give you any help. Just write it all down. But we need to fill in the blanks, don't we? We need to fill in the gaps. So we have carbon dioxide plus water plus light. 
in a vertic in, a, in brackets plus light makes glucose and oxygen. So that's one mark each. The green substance that absorbs light energy that's chlorophyll. It's not chloroplasts. Chlorophyll fills chloroplasts. Okay, so chloroplasts have chlorophyll in them. So that's a common misconception that people have. Chlorophyll makes up chloroplasts, and it's where photosynthesis happens. Uh, in bright sunlight, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air can limit the rate of photosynthesis. Explain what it means. Well, basically, what we're saying there is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air is so low that um, photosynthesis slows down. Okay, so that's our first mark. Our second mark is that last sentence saying that if carbon dioxide is the thing that is slowing down photosynthesis, then it can't be light or temperature. So there must be enough light and there must be a good temperature, the right, the right temperature, so they don't limit it instead. You know, carbon dioxide is the thing that's limiting it, not the other two. Give one environmental factor other than light intensity and carbon dioxide concentration, which can limit the rate of photosynthesis. Well, we've got light intensity, carbon dioxide, the last one is temperature, so it's got to be temperature. It's going to be one of those three. Okay, that's all we've got to use. Good. Um, what is respiration used for? That's a good question. It's quite a vague question as well. Um, have a think. Pause this video for just five seconds. Have a think about what respiration is going to be used for, and then I'll put a couple of a couple of them on the board, or PowerPoint, or video. We'll say video, shall we? Put a couple of them on the video. So. Respiration releases energy from glucose. That's the definition of respiration. It releases energy from glucose. Okay? Aerobic respiration uses oxygen to do that. And from it, what we get is energy that can be used to grow muscles. It can be used to grow plants. It can be used to repair cells, to build molecules, to break molecules, to transport molecules, to do any other chemical reaction that we need in the body to keep our body temperature constant. Obviously, we're talking about us. Some animals don't use that for that. Um, respiration is an exothermic reaction. That means it releases heat energy. Okay, so it, it makes us warm. That's why when you exercise a lot, you get really, really warm. Okay, because you've got lots of respiration happening. It gets hot. This is the equation. Okay, so we need glucose and oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water, and then in brackets, usually it's in brackets at the end, is plus energy. Have a look at this equation though. Do we notice that it's photosynthesis swapped? So we've got glucose plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water, and then from photosynthesis, it's carbon dioxide and water makes glucose and oxygen. So that makes it twice as easy because we have half the number of um, equations to remember, don't we? We only have to remember one, and then we just swap it, and then we've got the other one automatically. Okay, so either remember photosynthesis or remember respiration. Okay, either way is fine. If I were to put that into symbol form, we've got C6H12O6, which is glucose, O2, which is oxygen, CO2, which is carbon dioxide, and H2O, which is water. And for triple, that energy is in the form of a molecule called ATP. Okay, that's like our energy currency. For, for triple only, that one is. Again, exactly the same as photosynthesis. If I were to balance these, I'd put a 6 in front of the oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water as our devil's equation, 666. I'm not going to put a 6 in front of glucose. That's fine as it is. Okay? The glucose is there from the digestive system. So we will have visited all of these in the live Teams video. Digestive system, we need enzymes like a carbohydrate to break down starch into glucose, and then it's absorbed in the small intestine. That's what the glucose is from. Oxygen is from the lungs, and it's picked up in the lungs by the blood, and that's pumped around the body using the heart. Carbon dioxide is a waste product, and we exhale it, and water is a waste product, and we exhale it. And there's a simple test to do this. We can get some lime water for the CO2, and if you blow into some lime water, you have a straw into some lime water, um, it'll turn cloudy if there is carbon dioxide in there. And for our water, we can um, use a... Um, a watch my call. I've forgotten the word for the paper. We can use a paper that turns colour. Um, my mind's gone blank. I'll have a think of it. But there's a test for water <laughs> that you can use a piece of paper and it changes from, I think it's yellow to pink or pink to purple. There's something. I'll remember that. Or research it. Why not? Um, this type of respiration is aerobic because it uses 
and it uh, uses oxygen to release the energy. Okay, so we have that oxygen in there, glucose plus oxygen. If we look at anaerobic respiration, we're looking at respiration without oxygen. So I think it might be the next one. Okay, without oxygen. And you can see we just have glucose and then an arrow. That's it. Okay, glucose plus nothing. Glucose, arrow. Um, so anaerobic respiration releases a little bit of energy. I think it works out as about a sixth. I can't really remember. But it releases a little bit of energy, um, much less energy than aerobic respiration. And we also get this, this different equation here. So this is um, anaerobic respiration in plants. We get anaerobic respiration in plants and animals. Okay, So anaerobic respiration in plants is glucose breaking down into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Apart from knowing that equation, we need to know that this is very useful for making bread and beer. So it's really useful. It's a process called fermentation. Okay, So the carbon dioxide, very good for bread, causes the bread to rise. Okay, The respiration from plants is the yeast. We're putting yeast in. It's respiring. It will produce carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide will, will give rise to the bread. Ethanol is alcohol, so that's very good at brewing beer. And you get a, better, get a big vat like that, you put in your water, your hops, your barley, lots of glucose, bit of yeast, put the lid on, seal it shut, so we run out of oxygen very quickly, and the yeast can just break down the glucose into ethanol. Okay, Carbon dioxide is also released, which it isn't released for... Um, anaerobic respiration in animals, which we'll look at now. You need to know those two examples, by the way. People always laugh when I say you need to mention brewing beer in a GCSE biology paper, but, but it's true. You need to know that yeast anaerobic respiration produces ethanol and carbon dioxide, which is good for bread and beer. Okay? Anaerobic respiration in animals, i.e. us, doesn't produce ethanol and carbon dioxide because when you go for a run you get drunk, which is a bit rubbish. Um, instead, that glucose is broken down into lactic acid and again, a little bit of energy, not much energy. Okay, Lactic acid is very toxic to muscle cells. It sort of like bathes muscle cells. It washes over muscle cells when it's being produced. Um, so we've got to get rid of it straight away or those muscles will begin to cramp. Okay, they'll begin to cramp up and um, cause us, obviously, significant pain. It does really, really hurt. This is anaerobic respiration in animals. Okay? Um, if I make it very clear, aerobic respiration is with oxygen, and that is the same for animals and plants. It's always the same. Um, anaerobic respiration, which is not using oxygen, is different for animals and plants. And we can make use of the one from plants in fermentation and bread and beer. This one is toxic, it's bad, we don't want it. We need to get rid of that lactic acid. Before I talk about how we get rid of the lactic acid, I think it's a good time to have a quick pause and see if we can compare the processes of anaerobic respiration in muscle, i.e. animals, and plant cells. Okay, so take five minutes, Pause this video, answer this question that Mark Skier will be on the next slide. So pause this now. You can always tell with the number of marks on an exam paper how long you should be spent uh, should be spent doing it. So five marks here should take you about five minutes ish. It's always though one mark questions don't take a minute; they probably take less. And then four mark, five mark, six mark questions don't take that long. They'll take a little bit longer. So it sort of all balances out in the end. OK, let's look at some answers. We have got um, the structure in a eukaryotic cell. Again, the live teams lesson. We spoke about eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells and the mitochondria are in eukaryotic cells. The eukaryotic just means plant and animal. It's just a different way of saying plant and animal. Muscle cells and plant cells can respire anaerobically. Compare the process of anaerobic respiration in muscle and plant cells. Okay, so here is what we've got. We've got just four things. It can be bullet points. It doesn't have to be full sentences. But we have to say 
exactly what the comparison is. Okay, so if you just say it occurs without oxygen, that doesn't get you the mark. You have to say that both of them occur without oxygen. Both of them release a small amount of energy compared to aerobic. Muscle cells produce lactic acid, plant cells produce ethanol. And muscle cells do not produce carbon dioxide, but plant cells do. It's got to be a comparison. So with those last two points, if you said that um, muscles produce lactic acid and plant cells produce ethanol and carbon dioxide, that's pretty much the same. So that's two marks in one. OK, but there are there are four marks there. Keep it simple. Just four ticks or, you know, add in something that you didn't guess. Excellent. Now we are going to quickly talk about exercise and metabolism. Then that will leave plenty of time on my video to go over some practicals. OK, so here is our anaerobic respiration equation. And we've already said that lactic acid is bad. We do not want lactic acid. That's a no. OK, the body's now finished. We've finished our exercise. That person on that stationary bike looks to be sleeping. Um, but you'll notice that the breathing rate and the heart rate remain very high. OK, so we've got to say, why? Why is this happening? Why is our breathing rate and heart rate high when we've stopped exercise? It shouldn't be high anymore. What we do is we breathe in a lot of oxygen after we've exercised to get rid of lactic acid. OK, so oxygen combines with lactic acid and it produces carbon dioxide and water. And we know carbon dioxide and water because we breathe them out. OK, it's not as toxic as lactic acid. If we don't get rid of that lactic acid, we know we've got problems, we've got muscle cramps, and we don't want muscle cramps. Um, so oxygen is needed. And this whole process is called oxygen debt. And the reason it's called oxygen debt is because you're almost like you're paying back the oxygen that you were meant to use in the first place, but instead you used anaerobic respiration. So oxygen debt is repaid straight after exercise. That's why your heart rate remains high, and your um, breathing rate remains high. And if we look at a, um, a graph of this, we can see the left-hand side, we have heart rate in beats per minute, and we've got time in minutes. So this person um, was at rest, and then at zero minutes, um, they started exercise. The heart rate shoots up quite quickly. The breathing rate follows it. Okay. Um, but after 10 minutes of exercise, that person stops at 10 minutes and the heart rate gradually decreases. The breathing rate stays quite high and, and decreases, uh, you know, over a longer period of time. The breathing rate in breaths per minute goes up to 60 and it takes quite a while for it to get back down to 15. The heart rate's got there before it, hasn't it? So we've just got to be able to link these two things together and say breathing rate remains high because oxygen is required to break down lactic acid into carbon dioxide and water. Heart rate remains high for a little while to um, transport these substances around the body. That's transport oxygen to the cell, and that's also transporting lactic acid and carbon dioxide away from the cell. That's really important. Okay. The last thing is what our metabolism is, and our metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that happen inside the body. So anything where um, proteins are made, anything where lipids are made, molecules are, are you know, synthesized, brought together and, and formed, or where molecules are broken apart and split down into their individual parts. Um, that is uh, some examples, some examples of uh, chemical reactions that happen inside the body. There's loads and loads of different types. Respiration is one. For plants, respiration and photosynthesis are two. Um, we've got loads and loads that happen. Okay. Linked to exercise, though, you might have heard before what a basal metabolic rate is. Okay. And a basal metabolic rate is the energy required for the body to function at rest for 24 hours. That's why it's a basal. Basal means base. Okay. Now, when people talk about weight loss and weight gain, they quite wrongly talk about um, someone's thyroid problem or um, their metabolic rate. Okay, so it's a lot more complicated than just, oh, I've got a high 
metabolic rate. I've got high metabolism, therefore I'm thin. Like you, you just can't say that. That's very, very narrow to be able to say that. Okay. Obviously, if you require a lot of energy to function at rest for 24 hours, then um, you're going to need more food for that, aren't you? So what would happen if you stopped eating and only drank water? You're going to have a very significant deficit of energy. And think about weight loss and weight gain in humans as very simple. Okay, just very, very simple. If you have a deficit of energy, i.e. you're eating too fewer calories for your basal metabolic rate, you're going to lose weight. You're going to lose weight. If you've got a deficit of energy, it needs to find it from somewhere, so it's going to start breaking down fat and breaking down muscle to get it. Fat and muscle, that I've just said, metabolise to make up for this no intake of energy. You've got this massive gap if you've stopped eating. So people think, oh, I'm just going to fast, I'm just going to not eat for a while, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to break down all of the fat that's on me, and I'll be really thin and muscly. Actually, the body prefers to take muscle before fat if you completely starve yourself. It's not like it will only take fat. It'll start taking fat and muscle from anywhere, so you'll find your, your, your gains that you get in the gym, you'll, you'll lose that very, very quickly. Okay? You become very lethargic. Your body realises that you don't have any intake of, of energy, so it's going to want to slow you down. It's going to want to try and keep you in a kind of a rest state so you're not doing too much activity so that it doesn't have to take too much of your fat and muscle to, to make up for the gap. Obviously, you're going to lose weight. If, you're, if your fat and muscle has been broken down and metabolised to be used as energy, you're going to lose a lot of weight very, very quickly, and that's really bad. So, have a, you know, be sensible when we're, talk, when we're talking about exercise, gaining weight, losing weight. Keep it very simple. Too much energy, i.e. you've got a surplus of calories. You're going to store that surplus somewhere, ready to be used. A deficit of, of energy, a deficit of calories. You're going to be taking what, what you've got on your body, any, any fat or muscle you're going to be using and metabolizing to, for, for your use so you don't die. That's pretty much it. The very last thing before I get out some practicals and discuss practicals, we are going to explain why the breathing rate changes while doing different activities. Okay, so this is for the very last thing for me talking. I've been blabbing on for 32 minutes now. You must be bored of me. Um, I'd like you to pause this video answer this question it's three marks so think about three things you know three sentences what am i going to get my marks for and then i will um i'll put the mark scheme up as soon as you press play again remember you needed three things okay three things to get those marks if you haven't got three things pause it and get some more i think though from memory there are quite a lot on the uh, on the mark scheme for this let's have a look Yes. Okay, so let's look at the question again. So explain why breathing rate changes when doing different activities. Okay, so that just says breathing rate changes. So we could say that the breathing rate increases. We've specified that the breathing rate increases to supply more oxygen. And that's a mark. Again, you can have the reverse. Instead of to supply more oxygen or to get more oxygen to cells, you can say to remove carbon dioxide as the opposite. The second part, so we've already said that breathing rate increases. To get the second mark, we say for aerobic respiration. Okay, And obviously, depending on how you're structuring your answer, if you're going down the lactic acid buildup and why we have to breathe more is to get rid of that lactic acid and to break it down, then you're going to go through that route. But I'm going to stick with the breathing rate increases for aerobic respiration because we need more energy to be released. More energy is required by cells, so we need more respiration to foot that bill. There's a lot for you to choose. There's, there's, there's a lot for you to get three marks on. So have a close look at the mark scheme. Okay, have a really close look at it. And then if you, um, you mark, mark yours out of three. Okay, I haven't included a question book with exercise and metabolism, I'll be honest. Um, just because you'll have used quite a lot in your, in your lessons, if you've done, uh, definitely if you're a combined scientist, if you've done uh, bioenergetics or are just finishing off at the minute, 
um, you'll have done loads anyway. So I'm not, I'm not going to give you loads and loads of questions. Instead, um, in a second, as if by magic, I'm going to hopefully pause this and resume it when I've set up my practicals. And I'll take you through a couple of the required practicals that's important for respiration and for photosynthesis. If I go back to my first slide. Oopsie, too far. There, got there in the end. Um, I'm going to look at limiting photosynthesis, so that's light to limit photosynthesis, and also the, the experiment to test for starch. So I'll see you when I've set that up. Wonderful. Okay, so hopefully this has worked and we've just suddenly just like swapped into uh, practical mode. So I've set myself up a practical experiment at home using some of the stuff that I've um, <coughs> borrowed from the science prep room with permission. Um, and we're going to talk about the setup, what it's used for, common pitfalls in exam questions and also the types of stuff that people always miss. Okay. This is for the second, the second practical that I'll be doing. Okay, so I'll just leave those on the windowsill for now. Um, this is a practical that will explore how light intensity can affect the rate of photosynthesis. So before you'll have been talking about um, how photosynthesis produces glucose and oxygen, it's difficult to sort of quantify glucose production, but we can easily quantify oxygen production. Um, all we need is a light source, we need a meter ruler, we need a heat sink, and I'll explain what this is um, in a minute, it's just a, a beaker of water, I'll explain why it's there. And then in our, um, in our test tube that has a solution of hydrogen carbonate um, is a piece of pondweed, okay, so that's an aquatic plant, basically. And the reason that's important is because that aquatic plant will continue to photosynthesize while it's in the water. So that's really important, okay? Right, so with our experiment, we are going to be um, increasing, the, or sorry, decreasing the distance between the plant and the light source to see if the rate of photosynthesis increases or decreases. Because my plant is in water or hydrogen carbonate solution to provide plenty of carbon dioxide, dissolved carbon dioxide, then what I will see is I will see oxygen bubbles being produced from the plant and the bubbles will rise to the surface and I can very very easily just count the bubbles. If I wanted to be even more specific I could get some like a collecting tube like this, I can put it on my test tube and then I can connect this to I don't know, a gas syringe and that will give me um, a quantifiable, so that's like um, centimetres cubed, instead of number of bubbles per minute, I might be able to get a result that is two centimetres cubed per minute or something. So that's a way we can make our um, experiment a little bit more precise, okay, get a bit more precise um, data from it. I'll leave that over there for now though. So independent variables, dependent variables for control variables. Our independent variable would be the distance between the light source and the pondweed. Okay, that's an independent variable. We're going to change that every time. Okay, a dependent variable, what we measure, we will measure the number of oxygen bubbles that are released per minute. Okay, so I'm going to count the number of oxygen bubbles that are released per minute. And our control variables will be the size of the um, pondweed, obviously if you have a massive piece and a small piece, the small piece isn't going to produce a lot of oxygen compared to the big piece, so length of pondweed maybe. The temperature is going to have to be kept the same, and that's where this beaker of water comes in. These old lamps get very, very hot. We know as the temperature increases, so does the rate of photosynthesis. Um, it's not going to get too hot, but it will be enough to increase the rate just from temperature alone. So I want to eliminate that risk, and I'm going to put in front of my, if I put this here, in front of my test tube, I'm going to put a big beaker of water to absorb that temperature, okay, to absorb the heat coming from my lamp, okay. Um, and the third one that I need to control will be the carbon dioxide concentration. Now, that's controlled by using the same solution each time. Okay, so I could put the same amount of this hydrogen carbonate solution in, but that's really important to control that way. 
Um, when I do my experiment, I'm going to have to allow my pondweed to acclimatise. And when I say acclimatise, that means it's going to get bright for a second. Um, that means I'm going to switch on my light. I'm going to place my water where it needs to be placed. Now, obviously, that water is not stopping any light from passing through it. That's very important. It's not coloured or anything. It's just plain water. Um, so I can leave my pondweed here for, say, five minutes to get used to the amount of light that's been released. Okay. We'll get a steady release of oxygen, then I can start to count the number of bubbles per minute. Okay. So let's pretend that I've left this for five minutes, bubbles are being produced, I'm going to take my stopwatch and I'm going to record a minute and note down how many bubbles are released. Once I've done that, I can move it, let's say 10 centimetres closer. I'm going to move it 10 centimetres closer and I'm going to start the measurement after five minutes again. So I'm going to leave it again for another five minutes. It can reacclimatize to its new position, its new light intensity, because as we get closer to the lamp, light intensity will increase. So I can leave that for another five minutes. So fast forward and imagine there's been five minutes. I've now got another steady production of glucose and I can get my stopwatch out and I can time a minute again and I can record a minute again. 10 centimetres closer, 5 minutes to acclimatise, 1 minute to measure. 10 centimetres closer, 5 minutes to acclimatise, 1 minute to measure. Okay, so we can see the pattern that we've got here. We're going to move it, leave it to acclimatise, then measure the number of bubbles and then um, record it. Um, what I can do then, I've got one set of results for each of them. I can move it back to 50 and I can leave it for another 5 minutes and then go through my 10 centimetres, five minutes acclimatise, one minute record. 10 centimetres, five minutes acclimatise, one minute record. 10 centimetres forward, five minutes acclimatise, one minute record. And you can see now I've got two sets of results and I can do that again to get three sets of results so I can get my uh, mean result, mean result for my data, okay? All the time, I'm having a look to see what's happening to the result in my, um, the temperature in my water. Now, obviously I fast forwarded this. If you were to do this properly, it would take you a good 45, 50 minutes to complete. Usually we don't do this thing in normal times, never mind Corona times, but in normal times it would take at least a lesson, if not a lesson and a half to do. So it requires a double. Um, but we, all we're doing is common questions in exams we'll be talking about a few key points, okay? The first key point will be your variables, and you need to know that your independent variable is the length, uh, the distance away from the light. Your dependent variable is the amount of oxygen released per minute. You could say number of bubbles or volume. Your control variables are temperature, so that's why we've got our thermometer in here, temperature for our, um, our heat sink, so we need to keep the temperature of the test tube the same. The heat sink takes all the heat out of it. Um, the amount of carbon dioxide we give, which is the hydrogen carbonate solution in our test tube. Um, and then the, the other standard thing is just to uh, be able to describe a method. Um, so you just need to be able to describe this setup here that you've got, this identical setup. Um, it doesn't matter that I'm at home doing this. If I was in a lab, it would be exactly the same. And how you move it closer leave it to acclimatise, then measure the number of bubbles. Okay. Pitfalls, things that people forget to talk about. People forget to talk about this heat sink an awful lot. Okay, so this is the most commonly missed piece of equipment in this practical. It is literally there, it's just a heat sink, that's it. Okay, people often sort of replace this um, if they have an LED bulb here, the LED bulb doesn't get hot, so we do not need the heat sink if we have an LED bulb, because it stays quite cool. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it for the photosynthesis practical. Um, questions, you can get your six mark questions on, which is your method. You can get your um, ways to make the experiment more reliable or more accurate and that's using a gas syringe or something to measure the volume instead of the number of bubbles. The number of bubbles is quite um, sort of simple. 
And then obviously you can make it even more accurate with your number of bubbles by measuring over a minute and a half or measuring over two minutes instead of measuring over 30 seconds or a minute. So bear that in mind when you have that as a question that comes up. Okay. The second practical that we're going to look at is the testing for starch practical. Okay. So I'm going to do a little bit of um, TV magic and swap to my other practical and I'll resume this in just a second. Excellent, as if by magic, um, I've swapped my practical to the testing for starch practical in, uh, in the bioenergetics exam, okay? Um, with this, I'm dealing with some um, ethanol. It's not quite pure ethanol. I wasn't allowed to take ethanol home, so this is surgical spirit, which contains 90% ethanol, but it smells a lot nicer because it has extra stuff in anyway. Um, it's just what's used to clean wounds and stuff, so it's 90% ethanol, it'll do. It's very good for, you know, your corona stuff as well. Um, what we've got here is we've got a, a practical that will be able to prove the presence of starch in a leaf. So as part of the bioenergetics topic, we've spoken about uses of glucose and how one part of that use for glucose is to convert it into starch, which is insoluble, and it's a storage molecule, which is lots and lots of glucose molecules all joined up together, and then they um, are stored all over the plant, ready for use if needed. Okay? There's a few parts of this practical which I will explain, because they have a reason for them. Okay? I've got this lamp here, but I'm not using it, I just haven't got anywhere to put it. Um, we start with a beaker that's full of boiled water. Okay, so I've just I've got a kettle down there. I've just boiled the kettle. I've put really hot scalding water into this beaker, and in there there is a geranium leaf. Okay. Also in there, I've got a test tube that's full of my um, surgical spirit, and that is incredibly hot. The surgical spirit is actually um, is bubbling a little bit. I don't know why it's bubbling, but it, it it's fine. Um, and from this, the boiling water will start to break down some of the cell walls and membranes um, of those plant cells. Okay, so it's, it's changed colour to like a manky brown. Um, it isn't quite a nice vibrant green as it was before it started. And that's really important to get the process started to break down some of those um, cell walls. Okay. We need to leave this for long enough that it will start to break down the cell walls, but we need to um, take it out quick enough so that our ethanol is still very hot. Now, luckily, this, this was boiled like 20 seconds ago, um, so it will stay hot for a little while, okay? Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my leaf and I'm going to, it is a horrible manky color. It wasn't this color before I started. And I'm gonna put that manky leaf, I keep calling it a manky leaf, all leaves are beautiful. Um, put it into my ethanol. And my hot ethanol there is going to, hopefully, in a few minutes, is going to start to extract some of the chlorophyll out of my leaves. Okay? So, there's a reason that we do this. I'll talk while it's working. The chlorophyll will ruin or sort of um, disrupt our results that we get. Our result is going to be a qualitative result. That means it isn't numbers. It's what we see in front of us. Okay? Here... I've got iodine, and our iodine is, test, is a test for starch, okay? If starch is present, the iodine will turn a really dark blue or black colour, okay? If starch is not present, then it will remain this sort of reddy orange colour, okay? So that's our test. If I left the leaf green, what we will probably find is that if there was a colour change, it will be interrupted by how green the leaf is. Because chlorophyll is the pigment, is the green pigment that makes leaves green, if I can get rid of that pigment and separate it from the leaf, then what we'll be left with is, I, would, I want to say white, it's, it's meant to leave a white leaf because the chlorophyll's gone. In reality, it never does. Okay? It's very difficult to do that unless you boil it in ethanol for a long time. Um, with ethanol though, highly flammable, Bunsen burners, highly flammable liquid, it's not going to be the best sort of combination. So we don't tend to do that. 
we just tend to use extremely hot water, like straight out, straight out the um, kettle to use straight away, okay? Um, my ethanol is doing its job though, it is turning green. Don't know if we can see, it's starting to turn green. I'll leave it in there for a few more minutes. I might just give it a quick, um, a quick shake. There we go. Make sure it's just. I was just making sure, really, that ethanol is everywhere. Ethanol is completely coating the surface of the leaf. Okay. I'm going to pause this video and I'm going to resume it in a couple of minutes when that's had a really good chance to um, to go. Excellent, I think we're back. Excellent, right, so I've left this for a few minutes, I'll go to this. Um, left this for a few minutes now, and if I take the leaf out and give it a quick wash, because remember this is just water, give it a quick wash, we can see that all the chlorophyll, if I put that in front of the tile, all the chlorophyll has been extracted from that leaf now. And while it would be good if I had a piece of tissue, I'll try and get as much of the water off as possible. This chlorophyll here is now in the test tube, look. So it's been extracted out. So the hot water has broken down the cell walls and membranes to allow the chlorophyll to move out. The ethanol has removed the chlorophyll from the leaf. Okay, that had to be hot. Go to that. Now what we're left with is a leaf that I've washed and although it still looks a bit green, yeah, most of the, uh, if I put it that way, most of the colours come out of it, okay? So from there there's just one thing left to do. So we take our iodine and we very simply drop it on. Okay, you only need a bit, not a lot, just a little bit. And it should be an instant result. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work, which is what's happened here. Um, we've done everything right, really. The only thing that we don't do that could be better is use hotter water, okay, i.e. Bunsen burner. We've used hot water to break down the cell walls and membranes. We've used iodine to extract the chlorophyll. We've used iodine to um, show up the starch, and there definitely is starch in here but it's very rare that this actually works, which is, I mean, it does work, but in my front bedroom um, that turned office, it doesn't, it doesn't really work, does it? Um, questions know that this often doesn't work, and what they'll do is they'll just test you on the theory of things, okay? So you might have a leaf and sections of it have been covered with tape, and left to photosynthesize for a while. And it might say, what color do you expect the leaf underneath the tape to turn? And we'd say, nothing, because there's no starch there, because there's no photosynthesis. It would stay sort of like reddy brown, that's the iodine color. You might get a question where one leaf is kept underneath the stairs in a cupboard and the other leaf is outside in the sun. We'd say that the leaf outside in the sun is gonna turn black slash very, very, very dark blue because starch is present and the other leaf is going to stay as a red and brown colour because there isn't any starch present. Okay? So this all links in together and it links the two, two topics in bioenergetics together as well. So it's linking together photosynthesis and it's also linking together respiration. So photosynthesis is the production of glucose using light energy and respiration is using that glucose um, to release energy. If we're in the dark, if the plant is in the dark, what we'll have is we'll have all the glucose and all the starch that's been converted um, as a storage molecule, we'll have it all used up because the plant needs energy, it needs that glucose from somewhere and it's not getting it from photosynthesis, okay? So, let's have a look of what we've got now. Okay, so we have done a number of things with loads in this video actually, considering it's only 54 minutes long. We've looked at photosynthesis, we've looked at aerobic and anaerobic respiration, when they're used, what they're good for, that kind of thing. 
we've looked and linked that to exercise and metabolism, and then we've even gone through the two required practicals in this topic that you need to know, which is limiting photosynthesis with uh, a lamp, um, as light as the uh, limiting factor, and also testing for starch, which is um, that leaf, and then we use an iodine solution to see if there's any, um, if there's any starch in it or not. The checklist that you need, I'd like you to go on to, or oh, I can't click down on my um, mouse, um, the checklists on Teams, I'd like you to look through, and before December, I'd like you to have gone through those just to see what you know and what you don't know, and what you need to revise and ready for those December mock exams, okay? We've pretty much got through it all, so I'm not gonna extend this another five minutes. Um, if you use those checklists, use the answer booklet and question booklet, I'll put the answer booklet up by the time you get this, but use the question booklet um, to mark the questions that you've attempted, then um, please email me if you have any questions whatsoever and I'll do my very best to help you. I hope this has been helpful for you um, and that we've gone through in one day, in three hours, we've gone through unit one to four, um, everything that you need to know at a, at a level five sort of gisty level, okay? If you want higher and, fat and, and triple, just a little bit extra work. There's not much more, there's a little bit extra work that you could have a look at. Use those checklists to help you. I'll see you all the way back in school.